It's so good to see you guys. Thanks for being with us in person. Uh, thanks to those of you who have tuned in online to join us for our current teaching series called Christ the King, where we're studying the gospel according to Matthew. Our text today is Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. And our theme this week is the king's calling. Now, when I talk about the king's calling, I'm talking about the king's calling for us who belong to him. We're not talking about what God has called King Jesus to do. Rather, today we're dealing with what King Jesus calls and requires us to do. And the answer to that question is actually really well illustrated in a story that was published a number of years ago in the Presbyterian Journal. So hang with me and uh, let me read you this story. I think you'll enjoy it. It's a great story and it's got an even better message. On a dangerous seacoast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut and there was only one boat, but the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea and with no thought for themselves, went out day and night tirelessly searching for the lost. Many lives were saved by this wonderful little life-saving station. And naturally, some of those saved uh, and various others in the surrounding area decided, I want to be a part of this association. And so they began giving their time and their money and their effort to support this, uh, this group's life-saving work. With uh, more people uh, attending and giving and, and supporting, new boats were bought and new life-saving crews were trained and the little life-saving station grew. But in time, the life-saving station became more and more of a club and the people had less and less interest in going out on life-saving missions. It got to the point where they went ahead and said, you know, we can't really be bothered with that. We're too busy socializing. Let's hire lifeboat crews to do the life-saving work for us. And so that's what they did. Well, about this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast and the hired crews brought in loads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty. They were sick. And now the beautiful club was considerably messed up. And the club members got upset that those who were saved out at sea got their club dirty. They were so upset, in fact, that they called a meeting to go ahead and call for a vote to stop the club's life-saving activities because, you know, they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. But some of the members opposed this idea, insisting upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But in the end, they were voted down and told that if they wanted to save lives, they could begin their own life-saving station a little ways down the coast, which they did. It started off good, but as the years went by, sadly, the new station experienced the same exact changes that had occurred in the old one. It evolved into a club, and so another life station was founded. History continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that little coast today, you'll find a number of exclusive clubs along the shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters, but most of the people drown, with very few in the clubs caring about it or even taking notice. Friends, this is a simple yet striking illustration of the history of the church. This is what's happened over the last 2,000 years since the church's inception. Our calling as believers, for those of us who are, is to rescue souls from the sea of sin and death. Apart from Christ, people will drown in the fiery waters of hell. And it's our job to work as rescue crews who work together to save the lost. And that's how it usually starts. When we first get saved, we're really excited about sharing our faith. 
We're like, someone won me, I'm going to win someone else, and we are just fired up to win souls for Christ. Honestly, the newest series on Netflix, not even interesting to us when we first get saved. All we care about is reaching people for Jesus. But then time goes by, and all of a sudden, our passion cools, and we find ourselves in the same position as the Christians at the church in Ephesus, whom Jesus addressed in the book of Revelation. Jesus said, I have this against you. So he's speaking to the Christians at this church. And he says, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. Friends, the reality is it's so easy to abandon our love for God and to abandon our commitment and our passion and our enthusiasm to tell lost people about him. And the harsh reality is the longer we're saved, the harder we have to fight to keep our evangelistic fervor at fever pitch. And I think it's because of this reality that God has preserved the text that you and I are studying together today because it helps us to counter this very thing. So let me read it to you. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. A short passage, but man, is it a good one. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. And they were in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And Jesus called to them as well. And they too immediately left their boat and their father and followed Jesus. If you're taking notes, you can pull them out at this time. Grab that pen, and I'll give you some hooks to hang your thoughts on as we work our way through the story. The first thing that we see in our text today is what we're going to call the calling of Simon and Andrew. You can write down Peter if you want. That's fine. Peter's got 50 names in Scripture. But we'll say the calling of Simon and Andrew. As we learned last week... Because of the risk of Jesus being prematurely arrested and put to death, God providentially relocated Jesus from Judea in the south, where he had been ministering for about a year after his baptism, and God relocated him from Judea in the south up to Galilee in the north, and specifically to a little town called Capernaum, which was one of nine fishing towns located on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is absolutely packed with fish. Josephus, a first century historian, records that some 240 boats regularly fish those waters during the time of Christ. And among the many, many, many commercial fishermen who lived in that area were a pair of brothers named Simon and Andrew. Now, when Simon and Andrew heard about the ministry of John the Baptist, who very quickly became a national celebrity because his voice was the first prophetic voice in all of Israel in some 400 years, when they heard about the ministry of John the Baptist, how he was baptizing in the Judean wilderness by the Jordan River, Simon and Andrew, just like the rest of the nation, said, I got to go see John. And so that's exactly what they did. They took a couple days off of work. And they went to where John was baptizing. And it wouldn't have been hard for them to do this because where John was baptizing in the Judean wilderness, it wasn't that far from Capernaum. Well, when they arrived to hear John, the only thing John was doing was talking about a guy named Jesus of Nazareth. And John went on and on and on about Jesus. And over the course of the several days that they were visiting to hear the ministry of John the Baptist, John revealed Jesus to be none other than the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
And so naturally, when Andrew sees this Jesus that John's been talking about for several days walk by, Andrew follows Jesus. Now the question begs, where in the world was Simon? Simon is revealed in scripture to be this gregarious, extroverted personality, and he no doubt was taking the opportunity to be away from work in order to socialize with people. But Andrew was like, John's been talking about Jesus. Jesus just walked by. I'm following Jesus. And that's what he did. Now, Jesus takes notice that Andrew is stalking him. And so he turns around and he says, why are you following me? And Andrew appears to be a little bit nervous and kind of tongue-tied. And so he sort of awkwardly uh, makes a little bit of small chat. Well, hey, I don't know. I was just kind of, I don't know. I was wondering, like, uh, where, where are you staying? You know, and like, if, as if it wasn't creepy enough that he was following him, the first thing he leads off with is, where are you staying tonight, you know? But Jesus understood that this was someone who was interested in spiritual truth and was interested in further exploring the claims of John the Baptist that had been made about Jesus. And so Jesus just responds so graciously. And he says, hey, why don't you come with me? Now it was 4 p.m., but Andrew spent the rest of the day with Jesus, and it seems from the text that he even airbnb beat at the same place Jesus did. And after spending even this little bit about less than half of a day of time with Jesus, he became convinced that what John the Baptist had said about Jesus was true, that he was the Lamb of God who was born into the world to take away its sins. So the very next morning, Simon uh, wakes up, excuse me, Andrew wakes up excited because he's got his brother Simon on his mind. And he goes back to wherever uh, uh, Simon had stayed and he finds him and he says this to him. He says, Simon, we have found the Messiah. And Andrew drags Simon back to where Jesus was staying, no doubt telling him on the way the things that Jesus said that made him convinced that he was the promised one sent from God. Well, when Simon met Jesus, Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John, but you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So Jesus looks at him and he says, Simon might have been the Hebrew name that your parents gave you at birth, but I'm renaming you the rock, which in Aramaic is Cephas and which in Greek is Peter. So what I'm saying is Dwayne Johnson is a poser. The original rock was Simon from the Bible. Well, it seems that Andrew and the rock spent that day with Jesus. And then the following day, Jesus invites them to attend a wedding with him over in Cana of Galilee. And while there, Jesus performs his first ever miracle, turning water into wine. And we read this in John chapter 2, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. Friends, what that means is that Jesus manifested his deity through his miracle. And as a result, his disciples believed in him. In other words, they believed that he was God in the flesh on account of the miracle that he performed. And it says this, when the wedding was done, after this, he went down to Capernaum. So Jesus had set up his home base of operations in Capernaum. That's where he was living. So Jesus returned to Capernaum. But Simon and Andrew were commercial fishermen in Capernaum. So after the wedding, they too returned, very likely even traveling with Jesus from Cana back to Capernaum. So what a whirlwind of a week then for Simon and Andrew. They just thought they were taking a couple days off uh, from uh, being fishermen to go hear John the Baptist preach. And they thought they were just going to come home. But little did they know, they were going to end up having an encounter with Jesus. And that's what happened. They had an encounter with Jesus. They spent time with Jesus, the one that John was talking about. And then they even got invited to go to a wedding with Jesus. And at the wedding, Jesus performs a miracle and, and in doing so reveals to them his deity and they place their faith and their trust in Jesus. Okay, back to our text. When it says that Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew, friends, that does not mean that Jesus just saw two random guys that he had never seen or spoken to before. And when 
Jesus calls out to them. It's not like they were like, who's this stranger on the shore saying, come and follow me? No, 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 no. They had a reference point. They knew Jesus. Jesus knew them. And that being the case, you now understand why when Jesus called to them saying, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now you know why they did. Because Jesus had manifested his glory to them. Jesus had revealed to them through his miracle that he was God. And they believed on him as God. And so when God said, follow me, they thought it would be a pretty good idea to go ahead and obey. And that's exactly what they did. And so we see the calling of Simon and Andrew. But that's just the first pair of brothers that we see in our text. Our text mentions a second pair of brothers. And so the next thing, if you're taking notes, that we see in our text is the calling of James and John. From Luke chapter 5, verse 10, we learn that James and John were business partners with Simon and Andrew. You see, back in the time of Christ, there was three primary ways that uh, people would fish. Sometimes they'd take a stick and a hook, and they'd do that from the shore. Other times, they would have a casting net. You've probably seen this on YouTube, you know, nine feet wide. It's circular, got little weights on the end, and they throw it out, and it, and it sinks, and they catch the fish, and they would do that from the shallows. But the third and most, most profitable way to fish was through, uh, by means of the drag net. And the dragnet required two different boats. And so it was very common for those uh, uh, fishermen uh, on those nine different towns along the western side of the Sea of Galilee to go ahead and partner up so they could use the dragnet technique. It required one boat on this side, one on this side, one would hold this net, one would hold this net. They'd go out at night into the deep waters, not on the shore, not in the shallows, but in the deep water, and they'd catch way more fish. Well, friends, Simon and Andrew partnered up with James and John, so they were business partners. And the Bible says that after Jesus called Simon and Andrew, he just went a hop, skip, and a jump a little bit down the shore to where uh, James and John were, were coming in from a night of fishing. And when Jesus approaches them, they were mending or fixing their nets. All night long, they had fished, and fish would get stuck in the net, and they would need to be cut out. And so the daily chore, the morning after a night's uh, fishing uh, expedition, they would mend the nets. And Jesus walks up as they're doing that daily chore. And Jesus goes ahead and calls out to James and John the exact same way that he did with Simon and Andrew. And he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they too went ahead and followed Jesus because what I want you to understand is that they too had a reference point for Jesus. John's gospel doesn't record that James and John traveled with Simon and Andrew to go hear the ministry of John the Baptist, but understand this, just because it doesn't mention them doesn't mean they weren't there. Very likely they were which means they also would have been invited to the wedding and also would have seen Jesus manifest his deity via the miracle of turning water into wine. Now, here's the deal. Even if they weren't there, Simon and Andrew were business partners with James and John, and they no doubt would have told them everything about Jesus, including the miracle he had done. So regardless of whether they were there in person or they just heard secondhand information about Jesus, they too, like Simon and Andrew, had come to place their faith and their trust in Jesus that he was God in the flesh. So when Jesus says, follow me, they left their nets, they left their father Zebedee there in the boat with the servants, and they too went and followed Jesus. And so we see the calling of James and John. It was the same as the calling of Simon and Andrew. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Well, this leads us to the third and final thing we see in our text, which is the calling of you and me. Jesus said to Simon and Andrew, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus said to James and John, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And guess what Jesus says to you and to me? It's the same thing. Now the first two points we saw explicit in the text. This third thing we see is implicit in the text, 
But make no mistake about it, Matthew is writing and recording this event so that we can know that the calling of Simon and Andrew and the calling of James and John is our calling as well. So here we're talking about the calling of you and me. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, their calling is our calling. Friends, all throughout the Bible, what we see just from beginning to end is a concern for evangelism. The work of rescuing people from the sea of sin and judgment. For those of you who are taking notes today, I'm going to give your hand a cramp right now as I give you five fill-in-the-blanks back to back to back to back to back. But I just want you to see this from a high level today. So check it out. Here's what the Bible teaches. Number one, evangelism is God's concern. Number two, evangelism is Christ's concern. Number three, evangelism is the Holy Spirit's concern. Number four, evangelism was the primary concern of the apostles. And number five, evangelism was the primary concern of the early church. But what I want you to understand today is this. It's not enough that God the Father cares about the lost. It's not enough that Jesus, God the Son, cares about the lost. It's not enough that God the Holy Spirit cares about the lost. It's not enough that the apostles back in the day cared about the lost. And it's not enough that the early church 2,000 years ago cared for the lost. It's not enough. We have to have the same concern as them. Here's your next fill in the blank. This calling, it has to be our concern as well. And here's why. It's real simple. You and I are God's evangelism strategy. God said, I got to reach this world with the good news. I got to have the whole world know the, the glorious gospel of Christ, that there's peace with me through him. I got to get this message out. Well, guess what? God came up with a strategy for how he would do it. And you and I are that strategy. Now, I need you to understand something today. It's very important. It's going to be hard to hear, but you need to hear it. And so I'm going to share it with you. Listen close. To not share our faith is disobedience to the express command of God in Scripture, and disobedience is sin. There are sins of omission in the Bible and their sins of commission in the Bible. Sins of commission are this. God says, do not commit adultery. You commit adultery, you sin. He says, do not lie. You lie, you sin. That's sins of commission. But then there's sins of omission, which include the sin of not doing the things that in the Bible, God says we ought to do. And in the Bible, God says we ought to be fishers of men. I entitled the sermon today, The King's Calling, because two different times in the text, Jesus calls out to a pair of brothers. And so I decided to go with what's accurate, but I really hesitated to even use that title, though it was accurate and is accurate for this reason. I was concerned it wouldn't be forceful enough. I thought about entitling the message, The King's Command. And I thought about entitling the message, The King's demand because that's exactly what it is it's exactly what it is when jesus says follow me that's an imperative that means it's a command and that means it's a matter of obedience to serve god on this earth as a fisher of men is to obey god to not do so is to disobey God. And any time we disobey God, whether through a sin of commission or a sin of omission, it's still sin. And I want to show you this in Scripture. Unless you think, Mike, you're just being a little intense today. I don't think it's really a sin. Well, let's go back to Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And by the way, I'm intense every week. <laughs> just to set the record straight. Here we go. All right. Jesus said this, back to the church that in Ephesus that Jesus spoke to. He said, I have this against you that you've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. 
Jesus is calling them on their sin, and he's saying, this is a sin. You need to repent of it. You need to start obeying. I came to tell you the same thing. I told myself this message for the last two weeks as I prepared it for you. Mike, repent of your sin. Mike, repent of all the people you haven't told about Jesus. Repent and begin obeying God. And now it's my turn after beating myself up for two weeks to come here and share the same message with you. Amen. Repent of your sin and turn to God in obedience. Now, my goal today is certainly not to guilt trip you into sharing your faith. That's not my heart. Here's my heart. If you and I get in our mind that sharing our faith is optional, it's, you know, it's just something nice to do. Like, you know, if we ever come across a situation where it might be convenient to bring up Jesus, you know, like, like if that's our mentality, oh, this would be great. Like if it's convenient, if the stars align, you know, if, if someone comes up and says, who might be the savior of the world? And, and if that happens, you just go, Jesus. And then like, now I have fulfilled my duty of being a fisher of men. But this is honestly how a lot of us view it. It's just this optional thing. It's like, it's really nice to do like, you know, if you can. Hey, but if you can't, like, hey, you know, we're not saved by work. So like, let's not put any guilt trip on ourselves for disobeying the command of God. If we view evangelism as we should, as a command from God that results in sin, if we disobey, we find the motivation we need to witness. So again, I don't bring it up to guilt you into sharing your faith. I bring it up to give you the motivation you need to share your faith. Amen. When you realize it's sin, you just start taking it more seriously. Because when you love Jesus, you want to do what he says. Friends, it is the tragedy of all tragedies when Christians don't share their faith. Let me illustrate it like this. Once there was a man named uh, Luigi Terizio, true story. He lived from 1796 to 1854, and uh, this guy loved the violin. A novelist who knew Terizio wrote of him, the man's whole soul was in fiddles. He became a connoisseur and a collector of violins. His crown jewel was a 1716 Stradivarius in unused condition, which he nicknamed the Messiah. And it was his treasure. He loved that thing, but sadly, he robbed the world of its music. Throughout Terizio's life, it went unplayed. He just stashed it away in his attic. And in fact, upon his death, it was discovered that 144 Italian masterpiece violins were found up there in his attic, just not used. He loved the violin, especially his Messiah, but he robbed the world of hearing its music. And I can't help but wonder how many Christians are just like Luigi. Loving Jesus. Loving the Messiah. But robbing the world of hearing his music. It is music to the ears of the lost to hear that there's a way to find peace with God. There's a way to find an escape from judgment. And all I'm trying, it's so simple what I'm saying today. But it's your responsibility and mine to get that news out there. We're going to do that corporately as a church by starting multiple church locations. And we talked about that last week. But today we go from broad to a narrow focus as we learn and realize that it's not just the church's responsibility. It, we don't just come together on Sunday to partner together the pastors and the people to reach the world for Christ. We also have uh, incumbent upon us a personal responsibility to share the gospel with our lost friends and family members. We cannot just say, I love Jesus and think we're good. Here's why. John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus said this, if you love me, you will keep my commands. So we don't tell Jesus we love him by coming on Sunday and clapping our hands to the song. We don't tell Jesus we love him on Sunday by showing up here and during the music going, God, I love you, I love you. We actually don't. We show Jesus we love him by obeying his commands. And if we are obeying his command throughout the week by using our life to point others to Jesus, then when we come on Sunday and we lift our hands, God's like, oh, this worship is pleasing in my sight. When we lift our hands, when we clap our hands, when we sing with our mouth, gee, oh, God, oh, this is so pleasing to my ears. This is so pleasing in my sight. 
but it is not when we completely ignore the primary purpose for which God has left us here on earth. Because he could have just transported us up to heaven the moment we got saved, but he didn't because he has a job for us to do. Okay. I've been tough on you. Let's lighten the mood a little bit before we leave by talking about Nacho Libre. I love that movie for a lot of reasons, but one of them is this. In it, I see an amazing evangelism strategy that we can all adopt and should adopt. How many of you have seen Nacho Libre? Raise your hand. All right, the rest of you are living in sin. Go watch it this afternoon. I'm just kidding, but here's the deal. In that movie, Nacho walks up to his friend Escalito and he says this, and I love it. I love it. I love it. He walks up to him and he says, hey, I'm a little concerned right now about your salvation and stuff. And then that segues into something else. I think that's a great evangelism strategy. Just go up to your friends. Hey, I'm a little concerned right now about your salvation and stuff. And let that segue right into telling them about the Lord. All right, so maybe you don't do the impersonation, but what I'm saying is this. You can just say, hey, I've actually been kind of burdened by something. I sort of have something that's heavy on my heart. I I have a concern. Could, Could we have coffee? Could we talk? Hey, can we, can we grab lunch today? I'll treat. I just, I got kind of something heavy on my heart and I just, just want to talk to you. I just want to talk to you. And you just tell them about Jesus. It's really that simple. So what I'm saying is don't overthink it, okay? Don't overthink it. Now, some of you right now are going, Mike, I appreciate the words of wisdom from the great theologian Jack Black, but I think I need a little bit more evangelism training than what the movie Nacho Libre has to offer. Well, if that's the case, uh, no problem. What I want to tell you today is that our church does evangelism training church-wide three times a year. In addition to whatever sermons like the one I'm preaching today that are on evangelism, and in addition to any small groups that we have as a church that we offer that are focused on evangelism, three times a year we have evangelism training, and it's done by our wonderful Jess Pufumi, who you saw in our offering video today, who's ministering and being a light for the Lord and being a fisher for the souls of men and women on those campuses. You saw her in our offering video, and three times a year she teaches our surveyors course, and the next one is one week from today after third service. And they're awesome because in these surveyor courses, we're taught to survey our spiritual landscape, identifying who we need to reach as well as practical steps we can take to reach them. Now, last time we had it, I joined the about 150 or so people uh, who attended that class and, and I was one of them. And let me, I just got so fired up to reach people for the Lord. I could not stop talking about Jesus after that class. I went to the gym, I think it was like the next day, literally. And I'm like there and I learned from Jess that, hey, when people distrust you because you're a Christian and you can sort of tell that they distrust you, it's really good to go ahead and like establish some common ground instead of just walking up to them and be like, I know you don't trust me, but would you like to accept Jesus as Savior and Lord? (laughs) And so instead of taking that approach, I walked up and I just said, hey, uh, you guys going to the Big E this year? And that led into a conversation that ended with one of them saying, you know, my mom recently died. I just brought up the Big E! But we established that common ground. He said, you know, my mom recently died. I've just been feeling like I need to go to church. I mean, she knows I'm a pastor. And so I was talking to this couple. I just feel like I need to go to church. And I was like, invite card. (laughs) I pulled out the same invite card that you have, that we offer at the exit of every single one of our exits here. As you walk out, there's an invite card. And here's an invite card. We'd love to have you. Later that same week, I was writing my sermon, and I'm like, hey, my illustration has to do with my recent appointment with my physical therapist. I'm going to email my physical therapist, and I'm going to tell him I'm talking about how great his company is in my sermon, and I'm going to invite him to church. Well, he came with his girlfriend, and he said he had a great time, and he'd be back. This thing pumped me up, and so I want to encourage you to go ahead and sign up and be a part. I was so pumped up that I'm going again next week. Because I know my own tendency to have my evangelistic fervor just, just diminish over time. We get busy. I'm raising five kids. I got chores. I got responsibilities. I got things to sell on Craigslist. I got all these, you know, just so much going on. And we get busy and we lose focus. And this surveyor's course is just a time to recenter on, on Jesus and recenter on our purpose for why we're here on this earth. It's to fish for the souls of men and women who are lost in the sea of sin and death. 
If you want to join up, if you want to join us, if you want to sign up, here's how you do it. Open the Church Center app on your phone, click the Events tab, and just choose the Surveyor's Course option, and that'll go ahead and get you registered. I believe we uh, feed you, take good care of you, and then train you in evangelism. I will be there, and I really hope you will be there too. I'd love to see you. Uh, let's be fishers for the souls of men and women who are lost together. All right, let's pray, church. Would you bow your head? Those of you online, those of you here in person, those of you out in the foyer, let's just go to our great God in prayer. And let's say this to him in our heart today. Heavenly Father, today I repent of my sins, specifically the sin of not obeying the command of King Jesus to be a fisher of men, to be a fisher of souls. God, I've not made it my number one priority wherever I am to point people to the Savior. I have neighbors, I have friends, I have coworkers, I have uh, barbers, I have hairdressers, I have uh, clerks at the grocery store I've got, that I've never told about Jesus. God, please forgive me. Sin of omission, please forgive me. God, you could have scooped me up to heaven the moment I got saved, but you didn't. And after today's sermon, I now know why. It's because you have a job for me to do on this earth. God, help me to do my job. And I want to begin obeying right away. So I'm praying right now, God, use me uh, this week. Use me today to point someone to Jesus because I desire to be faithful to the king's calling. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thanks for experiencing this message with us. If you've been blessed by what you heard, you can give a one-time or reoccurring gift at newdaychurch.cc forward slash giving or text any amount on your smartphone right now to 84321. We would love to connect with you even more. So be sure to like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram. And don't forget to find us on the Church Center app for more information about all things New Day. May God bless you and we hope to see you again soon.